people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Lipakshi with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. All hell broke loose in Pakistan as the former Prime Minister Imran Khan was picked by Pakistan paramilitary rangers from Islamabad High Court premises. Arson, vandalism and anarchy followed. The unprecedented scenes, described as black chapter by Pakistan army, marked a fresh low in Pakistan's political discourse that has been plagued by months of political and economic crisis. What led to the situation? Why a former Prime Minister is in line of fire? Why Pakistan's army is being blamed? Why almost every Pakistani Prime Minister meets a more or less similar fate? Join us as we try to find answers to these crucial questions. In a stunning twist and turn of events over the entire past week, former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan was arrested by Pakistani paramilitary, forcefully escorted out of Islamabad High Court premises and taken to Rawalpindi, the home to GHQ, Pakistani Army Headquarters. It is alleged that Imran Khan and his spouse were given land worth millions of dollars by a real estate mogul via charitable trust. Imran Khan has denied any wrongdoing. Just moments into the event, everything descended into chaos and anarchy ensued. Never seen before scenes surfaced as Imran supporters cried foul play and vowed vengeance. House of an Army Corps commander was attacked, Radio Pakistan building was set ablaze and Imran supporters aggressively sought retribution from Pakistani Army for they alleged that Imran's arrest was an army handiwork which was desperately seeking a return to the top chair. In the eyes of his loyal supporters, Imran is beyond criticism and can do no wrong. Opposing voices, however, maintain that Imran was among the top corrupt leaders while in office and deserves to be barred from public life. Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif, whose alliance had ousted Khan from the Prime Minister's chair through a no-confidence vote, said he was not going to be soft on riots and would tackle the demonstrators with iron hand. Awam ko sadkon aur gaadiyon mein mahsoor kiya aur unki zindagiyon ko khatre mein dala hatta ke ambulance se mareezon ko nikal kar unki gaadiyon ko aag laga di niji wa sarkari gaadiyon ko jalaya gaya kanoon haath mein lene wale sharpasandon ko aani haathon se nimta jayega और आइन और कानून के मुताबिक उनको करार बाकी सजा मिलेगी While Khan's arrest has led to an unprecedented level of unrest in the country, it is not the first or exclusive instance of a former prime minister being arrested in Pakistan. Almost all prime ministers in the last few decades have either been found guilty of corruption or have fallen victim to the powerful Pakistan army, the country's deep state which holds a great sway in almost every political and business sector of the country. From Zulfikar Ali Bhutto and his daughter, Benazir Bhutto to Nawaz Sharif, Yusuf Raza Gilani, Raja Parvez Ashraf, Shahid Khakan, Abbasi were all imprisoned on one or the other charge. There are many who believe that Pakistan army, whose intervention in the country's political affairs is no secret and which has previously staged several military coups, is conspiring one more. 
The claim cannot be ruled out for Pakistan observers believe that the atmosphere is conducive for Pakistan army to take over and justify. The army has ruled Pakistan directly for nearly 33 years in little over 75 year history of the country. It is also accused of undermining democratic institutions and manipulating political process to consolidate its own power in majority of the rest of the history. Imran's arrest and subsequent outbreak of the unrest coincides with the massive economic crisis the people of the country have been grappling with for the past several months. The country is yet to recover from the trail of destruction left by floods last year. Inflation is all-time high, forex reserves have depleted and the number of countries that would assist it during a crisis is rapidly decreasing. Moving on from the bustling streets of Mumbai and Delhi to the tech towns of Bengaluru and Hyderabad and from the serene shores of the Bay of Bengal to the habitations in hilly Himachal and Kashmir, India is pulsing with renewed vitality. A new India under a committed Modi government is racing ahead with an unmatched pace of modernization. India's diplomatic ascendancy, economic transformation, swift infrastructural development and embrace of innovation and technology have collectively positioned her as one of the leading nations globally. But how has India achieved this remarkable position? Is it a miraculous overnight achievement or a meticulously crafted quintessential journey of success? What are the reasons responsible for the growing global optimism of India's future on all fronts? Is India set to reclaim her golden sparrow status? Join us as we take a deeper look at the policies and people behind India's rise as a global leader. India surpassing China to become the most populous country in the world could be another blessing for the world's fastest growing economy. With a median age of just over 28 years, and a working age population of over 900 million, India has the biggest workforce in the world. Even more significant is that this demographic trend will remain more or less the same in the next 15 years, a period that is being anticipated as the most crucial phase for India. India, which is making great strides in all aspects of the economy, is going to benefit immensely from this demographic dividend. India's young, ambitious and innovative pool of talent is already driving her economic growth faster than any major economy in the world. Experts believe that the addition of an even younger workforce will provide further momentum to its economic growth. India is one of the few countries that has consistently excelled as a top economic performer in the last decade. India grew by an impressive 8.7% last financial year. And while the growth speed of major economies like China and the United States, Japan and Germany is set to face major obstructions due to their aging populations, India's broadening consumer base, owing to a younger population and a productive workforce, is projected to catapult the country to the top of the global economic rankings. As per nearly all major projections, India will be the third largest economy in under 10 years. Information technology, the service sector, and agriculture, which have remained India's growth engines in the absence of a manufacturing revolution, will continue to contribute in similar fashion. There are three sectors of the economy, agriculture, manufacturing, and services. Till now, services has been the main sector, which has been a major contributor to the GDP of our country. Apart from that, consumption and demand. The consumption and demand, which we have the great Indian demand story, has been leading Indian economy, the growth of Indian economy. On the other side, the Indian manufacturing sector, which is now taking off in a real sense, will be the trump card during this fourth industrial revolution. Observers say India's predominantly young working age population which is projected to expand even further by 200 million in the next three decades, can and will play an important role in India's manufacturing capacity. 
One aspect that distinguishes present-day India from India of the previous century is that the young Indian population will not face challenges in accessing basic necessities and will have all the benefits of a well-developed infrastructure. They will be in a much better position to seize the opportunities effectively. From ensuring swift poverty alleviation to regular tap water supply in even the most remote of areas, from the nearly complete eradication of open defecation to endeavoring to provide clean fuel to people at the lowest rung of the ladder. The government of India has fulfilled the fundamental necessities to ensure her people a competitive position in the pursuit of becoming the best in the world. Many people still below poverty line, so we have to provide them all the services because what we are targeting is inclusive growth. The growth must reach till the last person. According to a jointly compiled report by the United Nations and Oxford University in 2022, which referred to Indian achievements toward poverty alleviation as historic change, as many as 415 million people emerged from multidimensional poverty in a 15-year period beginning in 2005 to 2006. A subsidy on LPG cylinders in rural areas has not just enhanced the quality of life of India's poorest citizens, but is also contributing to the country's sustainability goals and her net zero targets. 110 million rural households in India were receiving tap water by January of 2023, a significant rise since the government launched Mission Jal Jivan in 2019 to provide all Indians with tap water. With fundamental aspects addressed, India has now been able to redistribute her attention. India is now investing in human capital and skill development. Today, India is in a position to harness the potential of her massive population. As per economic observers, a skilled, dynamic workforce can further accelerate the Indian growth velocity and help her achieve the target of a 40 trillion USD economy by 2047. Pioneering efforts in renewable energy usage, advancements in space exploration, and India's efforts in infrastructure and other sectors have already established the country as a formidable force to be reckoned with. Appreciation of her business-friendly decisions and policies has manifested itself in the form of rising foreign direct investments. Her pro-people policies have garnered praise and respect of countries the world over. And when it comes to exerting additional effort, the Indian spirit knows no bounds. India is well positioned to take a giant leap forward, and there is widespread confidence that this leap will indeed occur sooner than later. Moving on, as the island nation Sri Lanka makes all-out efforts to emerge from a protracted spell of economic crisis, the country is now taking crucial steps to ensure a sustainable and futuristic socio-economic model. The country's local transportation system is set to receive a fresh lease of green life, with Colombo taking the call of electrifying close to half a million tuk-tuks. The government says that it is committed to ensuring its people a healthy and prosperous life and efforts at Climate Front are as important as any other. With assistance from the United Nations Development Programme, Sri Lanka this week launched an initiative to electrify 500,000 of its tuk-tuk cabs over the course of the following five years. Transport Minister Bandula Gunavardhane and UNDP representatives presented the project in Vera Hera, a town outside of Colombo, after watching a demonstration of an electric conversion of a petrol power tuk tuk. Globally, the energy shortage, increasing cost of energy, climate emergencies, and global warming all point to the need to accelerate efforts towards decarbonization of a society and economy. Here in Sri Lanka, the ongoing economic cr crisis, characterized by the limited access to affordable energy, reinforces the need to invest in renewable energy option and also to phase out fossil fuel. 
A switch to greener and cleaner vehicles would reduce Sri Lanka's dependence on fuel imports, which the island nation struggled for months to pay for when its reserves fell to record lows in April last year. The country is home to more than a million tuk-tuks that run on gasoline. The basic uh, advantage of having an electric three-wheeler is basically it is mainly for the environment that you are not actually uh, emitting any ga harmful gases as well as for your pocket because you will be completely saved the fuel that you are burning, the petrol, petrol cost. You will be only charging the, the electric vehicle using uh, the electricity which is more cheaper than purchasing petrol. 200 petrol power tuk-tuks will be converted by the UNDP as part of the project and the UN agency and the Sri Lankan government will work out plans for the remaining vehicles depending on the rollout's outcomes. On one charge, an electric tuk-tuk can cover between 80 to 100 kilometers. The tuk-tuk drivers in Sri Lanka are skeptical that this is possible due to the lack of charging stations in their country. Sri Lankan economy has been deeply hit in last few years. It has been able to make a little comeback with the help of the financial assistance and bailouts it received from its allies and the global financing body, the International Monetary Fund. Experts say among the host of measures the government needs to take in order to emerge from the crisis, efforts at the front of sustainable energy are going to be equally critical. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen said she hoped more women will join the Republic's Reserve Forces training so that the population will be able to defend their country. Tsai this week visited a Reserve Forces training camp in Taiwan where the first batch of female reservists were allowed to voluntarily attend the training for the first time. This is Jiao Zhou. 也以实兵实装的方式，让各位在防卫作战中处置各种战斗状况。我们的原则就是就地动员，就地作战，让每一位参加教招的人都有能力守护自己的家园。Taiwan's government is currently reforming its reserve forces training to increase its length and adapt exercises to reflect potential war scenarios more realistically. This push comes amid a heightened sense of threat in Taiwan, which has closely watched the Ukraine crisis and been the target of increased military and verbal posturing by China in recent years. Palestinian militants fired a barrage of rockets towards Israeli southern cities this week as Israel killed five senior Islamic Jihad figures since Tuesday, pressing an operation that has cost 28 lives in Gaza Strip, including women and children. Palestinian cross-border rocket salvos inflicted a first fatality in Israel on Thursday. Sirens sent residents to shelters in Israeli towns around Gaza as Iron Dome air defense interceptors were shooting down incoming rockets. The foreign ministers of Turkey, Syria, Russia and Iran met in Moscow this week in the highest level negotiations so far on rebuilding the ties between Ankara and Damascus after years of animosity during Syria's civil war. Turkey is hosting more than 3.5 million refugees from neighboring Syria. 
NATO member Turkey has backed political and armed opposition to Syrian President Bashar al-Assad during the 12-year civil war and sent its own troops into the country's north. It was not immediately clear if the meeting produced any concrete outcomes. Syrian and Turkish defense ministers had held talks in Moscow in December. Moscow is Assad's main ally and Russia has encouraged a reconciliation with Ankara, but Damascus demands full withdrawal of Turkish troops for relations to be restored. French President Emmanuel Macron welcomed the President of the United Arab Emirates, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nayan, in Paris this week. Macron and Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nayan's meeting came seven months ahead of the COP28 climate conference set to be held in Dubai. The UAE COP28 president designate Sultan Al Jabir said this week that the oil and gas industry should phase out its methane emissions by 2030 and that investment in technology was needed to develop carbon alternatives. The leaders also talked about the upcoming Paris summit for a new global financial pact which will take place in the French capital. Well, Indian tribal festivals are both unique and vibrant. Home to a number of tribes, Dharkand witnesses one or the other tribal festival on a regular basis. One such festival is Manda Puja, which is celebrated in the honor of Lord Shiva and Goddess Parvati. The amalgamation of rituals and strong beliefs on divinity greatly enriches the culture of Dharkand and festivals like Manda reflects the devotion of the devotees. In Jharkhand's Rachi, people celebrated Manda Puja, chanting the name of Shiva, the supreme god of Hinduism. The festival lasted for 11 days, in which devotees observed a strict fast. Women devotees performed Lota Seva, in which they placed a brass vessel filled with water on their heads and prayed for their husband, father or brother. People had arrived at Shiva temple in Rachi from different parts of Jharkhand to participate in the puja. This festival is celebrated in the honor of Lord Shiva and Goddess Parvati. This is the purpose of the purpose of God. We have the purpose of God's purpose, the purpose of God's purpose. और माता सती का जो बलिदान है उसके उपलक्ष में हम लोग भगवान शिव को मनाने का प्रयास करते हैं और अपने लोटन सेवा हो गया धुआंसी हो गया फुलखुंदी हो गया ये विभिन्न कार्यक्रम होते हैं जिसको हम लोग पार करके भगवान शिव को बताते हैं कि हम लोग आपके लिए समर्पित हैं ईश्वर The men performed Fulkunka ritual in which they walked barefoot on a bed of coals. This ritual is performed with firm belief that Lord Shiva is there to take care of them and the pure and true devotee will not get hurt. The rituals of the Manda festival include extremely difficult tests that the devotees undergo to show their devotion and faith in Lord Shiva. जैसे कि ये बहुत बरसों से होते आ रहा है ये हम लोग का धरोहर एक तरह का ये मंडा पूजा जो कि ये बुद्ध पूर्णिमा के दिन ही होता है और जो यहाँ जो भक्त गण जो घुसते हैं वो ग्यारह दिन का नौ दिन का सात दिन का पांच दिन का तीन दिन का घुसते हैं कोई कोई एक दिन का घुसते हैं ये आस्था बरकरार रहता है यही आस्था है जो अंगारों को हम लोग फुल खुंदी बोलते हैं ये अंगारों को हम लोग फुल समझ के इसमें आस्था से हम लोग चलते हैं जिसमें हम लोग भगवान शिव की महिमा करते हैं और आराधना करते हैं All the rituals that involve physically tough ordeals are followed with strong belief in divinity and hence each and every aspect of this puja is considered as sacred by devotees. The diverse culture of Jharkhand speak about their history and strong belief in divinity. Some believe that the test of endurance is also a test of spirituality. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. People have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. 
civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect.